This is the 21st lecture for MA 1012. In this lecture, we'll think about how to apply the theory of eigenvalues and eigenvectors to some simple systems of differential equations. I'll assume you're familiar with basic electric circuits, as we've mentioned them before. Um, so we consider a capacitor C um, current L1 going this way, and we consider um, uh, sorry, oh, sorry, it should have a, uh, an, an inductor here, which I'm not drawing very well, and then um, and then a resistor here. So it has some inductor here, L, and then R resistance and capacitors. Um, so there's a, a current I1, current I2, and current I3 measured in those directions. This is very poorly drawn, but it's better drawn in the notes. Um, so, uh, okay, so now we've got um, uh, to work out what, what is the dynamics of this kind of a system, this kind of simple electric circuit. Again, I'm assuming that you're familiar with these. And if you haven't seen them before, you may have to look them up somewhere. Um, so what we know is that um, the voltage drop across any of the three branches has to be the same by Kirchhoff's law. So V equals voltage drop. And... Um, and of course, this is this is going to be a time-dependent system here. So we'll have to figure out what um, how these things do, how these things vary. The voltages vary over time. Um, now, um, again, because of current flowing in equal to current flowing out, we must have I one plus I two plus I three equals zero. All this current's flowing this way. There's nothing flowing the other way, so it's got to add up to zero. Um, <coughs> and by Ohm's law. Uh, which is uh, applied to the, the resistor, we get that the voltage has to be I2 times R. Um, and we also have two equations from the capacitor and inductor. We get an equation from the top here, which is that C times dV dt is equal to I1, and L times dI3 dt is equal to V. Now again, if you're not familiar with this, this story, you can take these as equations that, that we know for some reason come out of this system. You don't really need to understand anything about electric circuits. You can just uh, accept that those are some equations that arise in the theory of electric circuits for this kind of circuit. So let's try to see if we can solve these equations or at least understand more or less how, this, how the solutions behave. From the equations that we already have, we can actually get rid of two of the variables, I1 and I2, um, and rewrite the whole system as di3 dt is V over L. There, it comes from here. But then uh, dV dt is um, using this guy here. I can put I1 over C and then um, use the fact that I know these relationships here um, to to solve that, I won't go through the, the algebra. Um, uh, this is V over L, and then I won't go through the algebra. I'll let you figure out how this the, the, this collection of equations can be rewritten as dV dt is minus V over RC minus I3 over C. The point is that that system of equations is equivalent to that one, and uh, you can see how that immediately gives you that by dividing by L, and then this guy, you divide off the C, and then you use these to plug in for the other variables, and you get this. So I'll leave you to check that. Um, so finally, um, we can write this as a system which invo involves these two functions, I3 and V, varying over time, and varying as the derivative of I3 is, is linear in V, the derivative of V is linear in V and I3, with constant coefficients. So and of course that that's also important that these are constants because they have to do with the structure of the of the circuit itself. The the numbers here are supposed to be constants in this circuit, and so those are the numbers that are showing up here. Uh, those are our constants. So we can rewrite this system in terms of a vector. We make a vector which is uh, i three in v. Of course, its entries are not numbers but functions that vary over time according to this. So x, you could say, is a is a vector which varies over time. It moves in the plane according to over time. And then we have the differential equation that dx dt 
is given by these guys. Um, DDT of a vector just means the derivatives of its entries, the vector of derivatives of the entries. Um, and then we can put that in here and say it's equal to 0, 1 over L, um, um, what do we've got, uh, minus 1 over C, and then uh, minus 1 over RC times X, because X is is I3V, and DI3 is V over L, so DI3, that'd be this guy, is V over L, and then I3 times this guy gives you uh, minus I3 over C, and then V here, minus V uh, over RC. So that's the system uh, equivalently. So we've now gone through transformations of saying the original equations that came out of looking at the circuit, just staring at the circuit, applying the standard rules, um, uh, give us these laws. We rewrote this system of four laws as a system of only two laws for two functions because you can use these rules to solve for two of the functions here, I2 and I1, out of these I3 and V. We've now written I3 and V into, into a, a vector and found this very simple equation. And we can rewrite that uh, even more simply as dx dt is ax, where A is the constant matrix uh, 1 over L minus, sorry, minus 1 over C, and then uh, minus 1 over RC. So there's the matrix uh, that's driving the whole system. So once we know the value of X at a particular time, this tells us how X varies over time. It tells us the, the derivative of X. And so we can use this, to, uh, this differential equation to actually solve for the unknown X um, in principle, although in practice it might be quite difficult. So let's work out an example in some detail where we consider specific values for the variables in the problem. Um, if we look at um, at such a circuit with r equal to 5 twelfths, l equal to 1 half, c equal to 2 fifths, uh, and uh, then we can try and figure out what is this matrix A so our matrix A is 0, 1 over L, minus 1 over C, minus 1 over RC. That's an L. Okay, so, so that's 0. This is 1 over 1 half is 2. Minus 1 over C is minus 5 over 2. And then, um, and then minus 1 over RC. Um, so R times C is 1, 6, so it's minus 6. So we need to work out um, the eigenvalues first. We compute out the determinant of A minus lambda identity and ask that it be 0, where lambda is an unknown. So that's the determinant of uh, 0 minus lambda, 1 over L minus 1 over C, minus 1 over RC minus lambda, uh, but then it's these specific values of those variables. So in this particular problem, so it's determinant of minus lambda minus 5 over 2, 2 minus 6 minus lambda. And if you expand that out, you get, so this times this minus that times that, so we're going to get lambda squared lambda squared here, plus 6 lambda, and then minus this, which is plus 5, and if we factor that, we get lambda plus 5, lambda plus 1. So we can see that the eigenvalues are lambda 1 is minus 5, and lambda 2 is minus 1. So now, for each of those eigenvalues, we have to find the associated eigenvectors. So well, let's try, first we'll try lambda is minus 5, find the associated eigenvectors. So we take A minus lambda identity, in this case is matrix A, 0, 2, minus 5 halves, minus 6. Then we subtract lambda, which is minus 5, so that means we add 5 to the diagonal entries. And so we get uh, we get 5, 2, minus 5 over 2, and minus 1. And I won't uh, uh, 
make you work through the details, uh, I'll just give you the answer that the eigenvector for this guy is, of course, going to be um, uh, 2 and minus 5, since that will knock out that. 5, 2, 2 minus 5. You can see it'll get 0. Um, and then we can work out for lambda is minus 1, the other eigenvalue. We can work out the eigenvector, so a minus lambda identity. In this case, there'll just be one eigenvector. There couldn't be two linear dependent eigenvectors because we've already got one here. We've only got two dimensions to work with, so there's going to be at most one. We know every eigenvalue has, has one, so one dimensional space of eigenvectors. There has to be one uh, eigenvector here. And uh, so this guy is uh, a, 0, minus 5 over 2, 2, and minus 6. Minus minus 1 is plus 1 plus 1. Um, so you get 1, 2, minus 5 over 2, and minus 5. Um, and so I can see already the eigenvector is going to be simply, let's say, 2 minus 1. That'll knock out the 1, 2 times 2 minus 1 gives you 0. So you can see the, the eigenvector. So the next step is to write, uh, is to consider if we can, we can use this these eigenvalues and eigenvectors to work out the solution of, a, of an electric circuit problem uh, for specific initial choices of, of voltage and of this third I. So suppose that at time t equals zero, suppose we had uh, I3 and V equal to um, five and four. Uh, right, so, uh, so then we want to know what happens at all later times. How do we solve the whole system for the ev evolution of this, of this electric circuit forever? Um, what we do is we need to write in terms of our eigenvalues and eigenvectors. We need to write our given vector. So we have a vector x at time 0, let's say x of 0, is i3 at 0, v at 0, is 5, 4. And what we want to do is to write that as some amount of the first eigenvector plus some amount of the second eigenvector. These were our two eigenvectors here, um, which we computed already. And we know that they form a basis, so we need to write everything in terms of that basis. We want to try and work in the best choice, the basis, the basis in which the problem becomes simplest. So. Our eigenvectors then were x1 and x2, and we want to solve for x in terms of them. So to solve this linear system, that'll give us the numbers a1 and a2. So that's uh, x1 is um, is our vector 2 minus 5, and x2 is our vector 2 minus 1, and x is this vector that we're given here of initial values for the i3 and v, 5 and 4. So I have to manipulate that linear uh, system of equations and solve it by putting it into reduced Roeschelon form. So what I want to do is first to add, let's say, uh, five halves of the first row to the second row, giving me uh, the first row is unchanged, and the second row, that becomes a zero. So this is the pivot, this two. It's killed what's underneath it. And then when I take... 5 halves of 2, I get 5 added to minus 1 is 4. And then 5 fives is 25 over 2, plus 8 over 2. 25 over 2 plus 8 over 2 is 33 over 2. Oh, it's not turning out to be very neat. Um, OK, then, um, this is the next pivot. It's killed everything under it. Now we're doing the reduced method. So I want to try and get the pivots to be 1 by rescaling. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this row by 1 quarter. And that gives me uh, 2, 2, 5, 0, 1, and 33 over 8. Now I have to get this pivot to kill what's above it. So minus 2 this to this, minus 2 of that to that. Um, so that should leave this unchanged. Uh, this last row is unchanged. And this entry becomes a zero. Um, but now the problem is that minus two of that's added to that. So I have five minus two times 33 over eight. There's five minus 
33 over 4, which is uh, 20 over 4, minus 33 over 4, it's minus 13 over 4, I hope. Um, that's something like that. And then um, now I have to get this pivot to be a 1, so I have to divide by 2, or multiply by half across this row, giving me 1, 0, 0, 1, and then minus 13 over 8, and 33 over 8. Now we've seen that these are the answers for the for the linear system of equations. That is to say, these are the numbers that I wanted to find. Um, again, we wanted to solve for our initial condition x of 0, 5, 4, which we were given the problem, given the problem to solve for initial i3 and v values of 5 and 4. That's our vector, x0. We want to break it into eigenvectors, the sum of eigenvectors, some amount, unknown amount. So a1 and a2 are again unknowns. I don't know what those are, but some amount of x1 plus some amount of x2 is going to give me x0. x1 and x2 are our eigenvectors. We plug them in. We plug in the vector x we want to solve for, and we try and find these coefficients. Those coefficients pop out at the end. And so we get them here. Those are their coefficients. So we find x of 0 is minus 13 over 8 times x1 um, plus 33 over 8 times x2. OK, so now we've gone as far as calculating out how to break up the initial value of the of this linear system of equations, the initial value pro, um, for the problem, into a sum of eigenvectors. Now we have to figure out how does that how does that make it make the problem sort of solve itself. So thinking more abstractly about the problem, we want to what do we want to actually solve for? We want to make this thing tell us what happens over all time to this system. So we just write down what the the problem was initially. We wanted this vector to vary according to this linear equation. So this vector capital X to vary according to this linear equation. Um, and if we have a specific matrix A, a that in mind that we've worked out, we've got actual entries for it above. But let's just for the moment think abstractly. Suppose we have a constant matrix A, and we have this problem to solve, this kind of linear problem to solve. Now suppose we have some eigenvectors, x1 and x2 as a basis of eigenvectors. It could, of course, have been more and more numbers of higher numbers of variables would have more basis vectors, but in our problem, they're only uh, it's only two-dimensional two-dimensional vectors, so we we'll need two of them to make a basis. So that means we can write x at any time t as some amount of x1 plus some amount of x2. Now, since a is a constant matrix that has constant eigenvectors, we can hold them constant. So these guys are just constants constant vectors. These, on the other hand, are functions, num number-valued functions. Um, and they tell you how much of x1 and x2 you have in this x of t over time t. How can I plug, if I plug it in, how can I solve the equation? You plug this in, and you get differentiation on this side, giving you da1 dt x1 plus da2 dt x2. And you can see we've used the fact that x1 and x2 can be chosen to be always constant. They just have to be eigenvectors, so they could always be the same eigenvectors because it's a constant matrix A. So I get constant eigenvectors out. They sit here. That's the derivative of this guy. So I've differentiated capital X. And on the other side, AX. What does A do to X1, though? It multiplies by lambda 1. And so I get lambda 1 A1 X1 plus. What does capital A matrix do to X2? It multiplies by lambda 2. And now, the separation to a basis of a vector is unique. So the x1 part has to match the x1 part, and the x2 part uh, has to match the x2 part. And so the coefficients have to match up, which gives me differential equations. da1 dt is lambda 1 a1, and da2 dt is lambda 2 a2. And this is the sense in which working in a, the bright basis is really very powerful. We're working in a basis of eigenvectors. We're expressing all of our vector quantities in terms as sums of uh, some amount of x1 and some amount of x2, of those vectors. Those are our basis vectors. And so in that basis, the system becomes very, very simple. It decouples into these separate uh, separate linear equations. So this very complicated matrix differential equation at the top here 
this matrix differential equation has a matrix here and a vector at capital X here, and it's all bound together. Um, so to solve it, you'd have to sort of solve for all of the variables, uh, all the capital X entry variables all together. But this has pulled them apart. In a basis of eigenvectors, the whole thing pulls apart into just number equations. There aren't any vectors anymore. A1 is a number of varying over time. A2 is another number which varies over time. There are no more vectors. It's all gone into numbers. And that's a sense in which when you work in the right basis, everything sort of falls apart. And uh, it becomes no longer about very complicated vector equations. It separates out into individual separate, note, separate differential equations for numbers. This equation knows nothing about that one and vice versa. A1 doesn't depend on A2. A1 only depends on A1. A2 only depends on A2. So that you can solve this for A1 entirely without knowing uh, that somebody else somewhere is solving for A2. You don't need to know about each other's work. You don't need to to uh, to know anything about one equation to, to solve the other. They're, they're completely independent of each other, the A1 and A2 functions. And in fact, we know the solution of this. Um, the solution is just that A1 of t is e to the t lambda, well, lambda, the lambda 1 t uh, times a1 of 0. I won't prove that, but it's easy to differentiate and check. And this guy has almost exactly the same solution, right? a2 of t is e to the lambda 2 t times a2 of 0. So if I know the initial value of a1 at time 0, which I do already worked out, I can calculate the value of a1 at all times by this it's easy to check. If you plug this into here, it actually satisfies this equation. It's easy to check that this function satisfies this differential equation. I won't do that for you. Um, so it's easy to see that these are the solutions. So what we've done, in fact, is to, by using a basis of eigenvectors, we've managed to separate out uh, equation, an equation that was, that was coupled together. Again, this is our equation here that was uh, one big giant uh, matrix equation. And for a very large matrix A, this would have been very, very complicated, binding together a whole bunch of variables, the various entries of the x's of this x vector. All those vector entries are all bound together with their derivatives being related to one another. But uh, we've pulled it apart. We've pulled apart that system by using eigenvectors. Because there's a basis of eigenvectors, we're able to pull it apart into one system for one function and one other system for another function. The entries of this vector, as expressed in, in this basis of x1, x2, each satisfy their own differential equation, pulling them apart and making it possible to solve those differential equations explicitly. Um, now we can go back and plug in the particulars of our, of our, uh, of our particular problem. We had in our case, a particular matrix A, which was A is um, 0, 2, minus 5 halves, minus 6. And we worked out that the eigenvectors, where x1 is 2 minus 5, with the value of eigenvalue lambda 1 is minus 5, and x2 is uh, 2 minus 1, with an eigenvalue lambda 2 is minus 1. So we can plug all that together into our system. Now we've worked out for our particular initial value, x of 0, where we started with our initial values of i3 of 0, v of 0. At initial time, we know this value of this particular i3 and v variables to be 5 and 4 in our problem. So we calculated out that x of 0 could be written as minus 13 over 8 x1 plus 33 over 8 x2. It follows, therefore, that x of t, by our general formula that we've already worked out in terms of how these a's vary, this is a, this is our a0, uh, a1 of 0, and this is the a2 of 0 quantities. So x of t must be given by e to the lambda 1 t a1 of 0 x1 plus e to the lambda 2 t a2 of 0 x2, which in our case we can work out to be, so this is lambda 1 is minus 5, so it's e to the minus 5 t times a1 of 0 was minus 13 over 8 uh, times x1, which we have worked out is um, 2 minus 5, um, all right, plus e to the lambda 2 is minus 1, times t, a 2 of 0 
is 33 over 8. And then x2 is a vector 2 minus 1. So that gives us the complete solution of, of our original question. We wanted to find out what is the, what is the um, evolution of that circuit. We had a circuit, which we drew initially. Um, uh, had some something like this going on some kind of very simple circuit and we said that we wanted to figure out how it evolved over time and what we've done is to calculate out how the quantity so this is um, the quantity i3 of t and v of t those quantities we found satisfied a linear system of differential equations with constant coefficients we took the constant coefficients put them into a matrix which was our matrix a um, we found its eigenvectors and eigenvalues and then every vector can be broken up into combinations of into a linear combination of the eigenvectors and then that vector will trans will change over time according to our differential equation it'll evolve over time so that this eigenvector just gets scaled by this factor and this eigenvector scaled by this factor and then we just put in our coefficients so we've explicitly written out of course, I could make it a little bit more detailed, writing out what is i3 of t, what is v of t, by expanding out all the arithmetic here. But that's a bit much to watch somebody do. So, uh, But you can see we have explicitly worked out, well, for all time, how this circuit behaves. Um, so we can plug in the initial time uh, behavior as these, these coefficients here, and we can work out completely what it's going to do forever from then on. Now that explicit uh, example, which is quite long, um, is of course an example of a general theory, which maybe it's easier to, to digest if you put it into the form of a, of a theorem. Um, we can say that we're interested in solving, um, so if we have our theorem, uh, so A is some square matrix, uh, square matrix, and, um, and suppose um, Y1 to Yn is a basis of eigenvectors if we could find one. We said sometimes we can find such bases and sometimes we can't. We found simple example, a simple example where it wasn't possible to find such a basis. But if there is one, if somehow you're given a square matrix and you calculate out a basis, there is a basis of eigenvectors of A, uh, we'll say with A, Y, I as lambda I, Y, I, I equal to 1, 2, dot 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 n so you've got eigenvectors um, then uh, the solution to the differential equation d capital x dt a vector differential equation that the vectors a derivative should be related to its value by a linear transformation of its value at each moment in time is exactly that um, that x at time t is given by uh, some linear combinations of um, s1 e to the lambda 1 t y1 plus dot 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 dot, dot plus s n e to the lambda n t y n where the s's are computed by x of 0 is s1 y1 plus dot, dot plus s n Yn. So we use a linear equation, once we have these eigenvectors, we use a linear equation to solve this for the s's. Let me plug them in here. Um, so that's the, the result. And the proof is exactly what we've already seen. If we want a proof, um, the proof is very simply that, well, we need to show that this solves. Uh, we simply uh, take the formula and, and, and say, well, then dx dt, if we have this formula, then dx dt, those are uh, constant s's. And so it's just simply... Um, S1 differentiate an exponential. I know how to do that. That's lambda 1 e to the lambda 1 t y 1 plus da 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 dot um, plus da da dot plus S n lambda e to the lambda n t y n equals. Um, but I know what that is. That's a lambda 1 times y 1 is exactly, it's an eigenvector. So this is its eigenvalue, so that's e to the lambda 1 t a y1 because this lambda 1 and this y1 packed together make a y1 um, because of the eigenvector equation. It's an eigenvector. Uh, da, 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 plus 
Same thing for all of them. This would be lambda n. So the lambda n and the y n will pack together to make uh, an a y n. Now I can factor out all the a's. The a factors out by because it's just a matrix. It factors out, pulls out in front of numbers. That pulls out in front of those numbers, and I factor them all out, and I get a times s one e to the lambda one t y one plus dot 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 plus s n e to the lambda n t y n. Uh, but that's just exactly a x, and that's the proof. Um, that proves that it satisfies the differential equation, that the expression we gave satisfies the differential equation. So that means we can explicitly solve differential equations of this linear type, this rather special linear type, as long as the matrix here has a complete basis, has a basis of eigenvectors. If there are enough eigenvectors, you can solve the differential, these differential equations explicitly. If there aren't enough eigenvectors, it's more difficult and we won't do it. So effectively, in this, in this lecture, what we've done is to study in great detail how you'd go about solving a differential equation like this. This is a first-order equation because it only involves um, one derivative. A derivative is a first order. It's a first order different ordinary differential equation. Ordinary means it doesn't involve partial derivatives. It is only derivatives with regard to one particular variable t. So it's a first order ordinary differential equation. A differential equation is ordinary if it only involves derivatives in a single variable first order ordinary differential equation. So in the next lecture, we'll think about uh, higher order ones. We'll think about second order. So in this case, we've solved all the, essentially we've solved pretty much all the first order ones, at least as long as this A has a basis of eigenvectors and is constant. We've solved all those sorts of things. So we've solved a lot of first order. And the next lecture, we want to think about second order, which are rather more natural um, from the physical perspective.